Uh, uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, thank you for coming this afternoon. Um, we'll, we'll start now. Uh, as you know, we've been uh, holding these consultations now uh, since yesterday. Uh, we were in Osori and then Suva and this morning we were in Bar. Uh, we are here now and then on next week, Monday, we go to um, Sabu Sabu and Lambasa. And Tuesday we are in Latoka. Uh, the idea is to provide you a very quick snapshot of the reforms itself the job evaluation exercise. As you know, we've already had the first round uh, specifically for teachers. Uh, this, of course, we originally said we'd have it for nurses. We've opened it up for every, all, all the other civil servants. Uh, a lot of the issues, as you know, that uh, you'll find, obviously, that we'll raise today are specific to the job evaluation and the civil service reform themselves. What we've found in the past couple of days that people actually are raising uh, issues that pertain more to the administration within their own ministries themselves and how it actually is implemented. Uh, I'll uh, present a few slides and then Jane Curran, who's the Director of the Civil Service Reform Management Unit, will actually uh, then present a few slides on the job evaluation exercise itself. Uh, we then have a question and answer session. If you have any questions, uh, we can answer all of that uh, for you. And then after that, we have a very quick, short presentation with your concurrence uh, on the budget, because you obviously need to know how the money is being spent. Uh, so if we have time, then we have a quick uh, presentation on the budget, and we can ask questions on, on that also. Okay, is that okay? Okay, so we start off with the first one. Uh, a lot of people talk about the retirement age. Um, the retirement age in Fiji, uh, before the 1987 coup, used to be 60 years old. And when Rambuka did the carry, he carried out the coup, he then uh, decided to reduce the retirement age from 60 to 55. And then it continued at 55 until the Garasi government came in, in 2000. And then they decided to put up the retirement age from 55 to 60. And then of course we came in and we reduced the retirement age to 55. The reasons, uh, many people speculate, the reason why the Rambuka government reduced the retirement age from 60 to 55 because he wanted to get rid of a few people, uh, perhaps based on ethnicity or whatever. Um, that's their reason. Uh, of course, the Garasi government came in and put up the retirement age to 60. Uh, what's that? What's that noise? There's a static. Is that somebody's... Uh, No, 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 this is static. we did do that was because today 69.4% of the entire Fijian population is below the age of 40. So those of you who are below the age of 40 are in the majority. People like me are in the minority. So in order for us to ensure that people at the bottom end, as in if you look at the pyramid of age distribution in Fiji, our age distribution is like this. So we need to ensure that people at below the age of 40 actually have a better chance of getting employment. And this is specifically the reason why we did do that. With the, um, those people who reach the age of 55, they can be re-engaged if they have a particular skill set that is a scarce skill set. So for example, at the moment, there's a shortage of doctors. Uh, there has been at times where there's been a shortage of midwives. So when the Ministry of Health then puts up a submission and says, look, you know, there's no other midwives available, then we actually re-engage people after the age of 55 and give them on a one-year contract basis. So that's the history pertaining to um, the retirement age. We've set that out for you. And the idea, of course, is uh, uh, to ensure that we, as I said, continue to provide, provide the jobs for those below the age of 55. The next slide, please. Now, what is the objective of the reform? The objective of the reform, of course, 
is to create a modern civil service uh, that's in place to also ensure that we, with the reforms, we carry out specific uh, uh, changes to improve your your working conditions, which not only includes your salaries and allowances, but also the work environment itself. So, you know, things like meal allowances. As you've seen, we put up the meal allowance from $9 to $20. Uh, some people have said to us, well, it's too much. Well, you know, $20 may be too much in Tavua, but $20 in general is not that much. So this is why we sort of erred on the side of being, making it slightly higher, because as you know, the, the cost of meals, depending on which town you are in, can vary quite enormously. So we'd rather put it up to $20 than to have it, say, $11 or $12 or $13, etc. But it's also about, the reforms is also about ensuring that we have uh, uh, transparent processes in respect of the OMRS system, ensuring that people have the ability to stay within the system. As Jane will also tell you, and one of the things we did find when we actually um, uh, did a comparison of the salaries between what people get paid in the civil service compared to the private sector, generally we found that at the uh, entry level, we were paying a lot more than the private sector. But is the, so if, if you say the civil servants were here and the private sector was here, but as the years went by, this dipped down, the private sector picked up. This is why you find in a lot of the uh, jobs that we have, a lot of people after staying in the civil service for a few years, they actually leave. They go into the private sector because the private sector actually pays more. Uh, we find a lot of that happening in some professions more than others. The other issue, of course, is that we need to ensure that people stay within the system and the idea is to retain those good people within the system. I've heard so many times since uh, you know, 2007, people have said to me, oh, that person got the promotion because he's in Tauke, that person got the promotion because he's in the Fijian, that person got the promotion because uh, the permanent secretary knows him, or they went to the same school together, or they went to the same, they come from the same province, or whatever it was. So we obviously, in order to, for the reforms, the idea is to create a huge level of transparency so when people do get appointed and people do get promoted or even demoted, people do know that it's done through a very independent and transparent process. So that's obviously part of the civil service reforms also. Part of the reforms is also to ensure that the provisions in the constitution is actually uh, adhered to. As you know that the contracts that you have, may have already signed, or the contracts that you will be signing, actually is between you and the permanent secretary. Those of you who have been in the civil service for quite some time would know that previously the, uh, the appointments, etc., was done by the Public Service Commission. That obviously is no longer the case. The Public Service Commission simply looks, appoints the permanent secretaries. That's their job. Uh, they don't appoint anybody else. But of course, we have a right of appeal to the Public Service Commission, and I'll come to that uh, later on. But the idea, of course, for us as a government is if we retain good people within the civil service and we give you a specific career path, we are able to then provide specific levels of service to members of the public. And that obviously is our ultimate goal. I mean, as we said to the, um, the Ministry of Education, for example, there was a lot of issues raised about how the head, of, uh, head office of Ministry of Education uh, did not look after teachers. Uh, so what we said to the Ministry of Education head office, you need to be able to look after the teachers. There's something like 10,000 teachers. You have to look after the teachers because they are clients. Then if you look after the teachers, then the teachers will be able to look after our clients. And our clients are 220,000 students. So ultimately the idea is to give the best service to those clients of yours. So many of those of you who are nurses, your clients obviously are the patients that come through the door. So if you provide good service to them, then obviously they'll go away satisfied. Now, you will be able to provide better service to them if you yourself are satisfied with your work environment. This is the responsibility of the people who administer you to ensure that whose clients you are, that you are actually given the right 
terms and conditions and the work environment and the systems are all, you know, independent and transparent. So that's the mentality we need to adopt and that's what we want to do uh, through the reform. Next please. OMRS, the OMRS system obviously uh, was introduced in January of 2016. The idea is to ensure that the OMRS takes those things into consideration. Your knowledge, experience, skills and abilities required for the job are considered in the assessment. You've also said now that the OMRS now, for example, if you go for a job interview on in the OMRS, all those positions that fall in the band J and below, in the panel, you normally have three people sitting in the panel when you go for the interview. At least one person must be from outside the middle. So, uh, what's actually going to happen is that those people who also sit in the panel need to be people who are actually trained in the OMRS. Now, uh, I'll give you an example. In the Ministry of Economy, a few months back, there is a particular position, a person was uh, nominated to be appointed to that position, and we discovered that the panel that actually sat to do the interview, one of the persons in the panel was not trained in the OMRS. So we sent it back and they had to go through the entire process again. Now the other point of course is under this process, when you apply for a job, if you're not, if you're not satisfied with the process, if you believe the process is not transparent or procedures weren't adhered to, you have the right to appeal. Now for example, if this lady applies for a particular position and she wants to appeal, she writes directly to the PSC. She does not have to tell a uh, uh, superior, she does not have to tell a permanent secretary, she simply writes directly to the PSC. Now why does she appeal to the PSC? Because it is the responsibility of the permanent secretary to ensure the process is independent. And the PS, PS, sorry, and the PS is responsible to the PSC, because the PS is employed by the PSC. So she writes to the PSC saying, I'm from whatever ministry I applied for this particular job, and this is what I believe is the issue. The PSC has now a full-time commissioner, um, and his name is Laurie McGrath, he's an Australian, who actually reviews all appeals. I think there's been about four or five appeals. Four have been upheld. So people are already appealing. So four of them have been upheld. If he finds that the process was not adhered to, then he will simply write to the PS. He won't say that this lady is the one who appealed will write to the PS and say, we have to redo this job process again for this particular position. Because the reason why he should not know who actually appealed, because we don't want her to be victimized. And it's all paper-based. You don't actually have to orally turn up. She simply does it through a paper-based process. So, now, the reason why the PSC cannot, say, appoint her or don't appoint her, because they don't have the authority to appoint people. They simply have the authority to review the process if it's not done, then the PS has to make sure we do redo the entire process again. Contracts can be up to five years. Now, teachers and nurses generally get our contracts up to five years, that's what we said. And also, teachers and nurses, because of the large scale of numbers and the profession that they are in, get an automatic right of renewal, subject to all the other uh, things being equal. Now. Uh, Jane will talk to you more about the contracted office of balance of the current term. Now, there's a, there was a lot of misinformation um, out in the, in the press, uh, out uh, by some media organizations, uh, some trade unionists who were saying that just because people are on contracts, therefore you cannot get a bank loan. That's utter nonsense. Uh, you can get a bank loan. The banks have all come out and said you can get bank loans. Uh, even prior to this job, when I was in the private sector, I had a three-year uh, employment contract. I got a loan. I got two loans, actually. So you can do that. There's nothing stopping you. Every single person outside government is actually on a contract. If you go to any employer, everybody has a contract of employment. So it's a fallacy to say that you won't get any bank loans. 
The other issue, of course, is that 70% of all the people prior to the reforms in the civil service are already in contracts in any case. Uh, so, you know, it was not something that was out of the ordinary. Um, the other thing also is just because you have a contract, some people think, just because there's a contract that, you know, um, the permit secretary can wake up in the morning and say, you know, I don't like this lady, therefore I'll contract the term, uh, her, her employment. No, you can't do that. Obviously, you're guided by the terms of the contract. And secondly, uh, any termination, any suspension needs to be in, uh, through natural justice, which means you have to say why you want to terminate. You have to put the allegation, I have a right of response. And then when the determination made, you have to give the reasons for the determination. Even after that, after a decision is made, if you feel aggrieved and it means through the appeal process, you can still go to the Employment Relations Tribunal. If you don't like the decision, you can also go to the, the High Court and challenge those decisions. Now, the the contracts, of course, capture the pay rises that has been given to people. Some people, of course, have received a pay rise about in excess of 70%. Some people, or positions, I should say, attract pay rise of about 70%, some of them 30-40%, some of them 15%, some of them slightly less than 15%. But what the system actually does is that it gives you that level of comfort that you know this is now your new salary. And these are the terms and conditions of employment. You, of course, if you have not signed the contract, there's no pressure on you to sign. Just because you have not signed the contract does not mean you lose your job. But you're not going to get the new pay rise is obviously the contract will capture what are the new terms and conditions. So you can continue. And obviously, for example, um, if you are sitting on, say, $20,000 salary, and it may, say, attract the position of, say, senior officer, that senior officer position now gets $25,000 and you still stay on $20,000, obviously your salary level will have to attract the position that $20,000 now gives, if you, if you understand what I mean. What I'm saying is that you won't necessarily will have that position anymore because the salary for that position is different and you're sitting on $20,000. So this is why a lot of people actually sign the contracts. We actually encourage you to sign it, but ultimately the choice is yours. For you not to sign, it does not mean if you don't sign, you'll lose your job. And Jane can, of course, highlight more on that issue later on. Next, please. Now, um, discipline and reforms, of course, uh, all of this is actually available on the website. You can go to the website in the Ministry of Economy and the civil service reform uh, people have actually published this, uh, these guidelines, OMRS, the discipline guidelines, all of this, the appeal process, all of this is published. You can get that. It's uh, done quite openly. Now, what we are saying is discipline needs to be also positive discipline. So the example that I've been using is this. A lot of teachers in PG, for example, they also, when they go to school, they double up as counselors. The reason why they double up as student counselors is because we don't have many trained professional counselors in PG. A lot of teachers go volunteer to become a counselor. Now, assuming the teacher, uh, you know, makes a decision as a counselor, and then there's a complaint lodged against the teacher. He said, oh, the teacher should have done X, Y, Z when they were the teacher, uh, when they were counselor. And you may have some, uh, parent may make a complaint, a student may make a complaint. And you, you, may, you may have investigations, you may find that the teacher actually did not do the right thing. Now, the teacher may not have done the right thing, not because they deliberately wanted to not do the right thing, but perhaps because the teacher did not have the right amount of training and exposure. They're doing a job that they don't necessarily have the skill sets for. So a positive disciplinary outcome of that would be saying, yes, the reason why this person did not do X, Y, Z is because they don't have the training. So therefore, the positive outcome would be we need her to go for some training. That's what you call a positive discipline outcome. To be able to ensure that that problem no longer occurs because they get that level of, of exposure. Of course, you know, uh, there are other instances uh, where people do do the wrong things. When allegations are put, they need to go through the process. And again, as I said, we need to have natural justice uh, in that respect, and that's obviously highlighted. It may also require, there needs to be better supervision, needs to be better management. 
we found, of course, that people generally in the civil service, in particular some superiors, they're not very good at communicating exactly what you want. So maybe there's a problem with the manner in which they communicate with you and how we can improve that. All of this, ladies and gentlemen, is all about creating a sense of um, and, and practical sense of modernity within the civil service. As we've, as we've said in all the other um, uh, consultations we've had, what we've also discovered in the feedback we've got, many of the ministries, the HR department are some of the most weakest departments. A lot of the people aren't necessarily trained in that area. They aren't necessarily responsive to the people that they are supposed to look after. They don't necessarily appreciate what the people in the respective areas go through. We had, for example, yesterday uh, a whole a group of people complaining about uh, how the HR department in the Ministry of Health was not responding to the queries. They had applied for jobs and they weren't getting a response back on time. That obviously is not acceptable. Uh, that obviously is not very professional. So we need to be able to inculcate that sense of professionalism uh, within, the, within the system. We also have training that's available and Jane will talk more about that uh, uh, with you. Thanks. We have also now... Now, one of the things that we have done is in this reform, the job evaluation exercise, we've looked at everybody's salary, base salary, what do you call it, base salary? The salary for what? What salary should be paid for the various positions? Yeah, so if you have, if you're a specialist nurse, what should be the base salary? If you're a land surveyor, what should be the base salary? Given what's happening in the market, given what's being paid in the private sector. That's what you call fixing up the base. Now, going forward then, then we have what we call individual assessments of you going forward. What that does now is brings you up in alignment, or almost in alignment with the market. And then we provide a regular ability for you to get pay rise. So you get assessed individually. If you see where you sit in the band, you have the ability to move within the band based on your performance. Now, all of that, Jane will talk to you about that later on. As you know, previously in the old system, when you applied for a position, they normally pegged you at the bottom end of the salary of that band. And it's very difficult for you to move whilst holding the position for you to get a pay rise. So this is why a lot of people in the civil service, they like the titles, you know. They like titles. So a title means a pay rise. We really should not be chasing after titles. You should be chasing after your own individual assessments. So, for example, we found people who may be, say, working in Ministry of uh, Industry and Trade for 10 years and specialize in international trade. But because they've been there in their position for a while, they don't have the ability to get a pay rise. So what they do in order to get a pay rise, say, assuming they're in a senior position, they will look for a principal position. So they'll look throughout the government. So they might find a principal position in say Ministry of Mangroves. So they'll go there because it'll mean you'll get a pay rise. They'll get a pay rise. But really they're not interested in mangroves. The industry, they're interested in industry and trade. But they'll go there only to get a pay rise. So what actually happens, you have somebody working in a position they don't feel passionate about and we've lost all the 10 years of experience they've had and they'll go there to the new ministry, it takes them probably another five or seven years to know more about that particular job itself. And before the old way of thinking was, you say if these th three people applied for the job, because she's been in the service more longer, she has a better chance of getting the job. Because she's senior in years. But she may be the high flyer. She may be spending half the time in the grog boat. But because she's senior, she has a better chance of getting the job. What we want to do in the new system is that if somebody is a better performer, they should be able to get the job also. That's what you call under the OMRA system. It's performance based. Also, these assessments will be rolled out. They've currently been conducted. They'll be rolled out by the end of uh, this year, by 2017. So you'll know exactly what's the criteria that will be used to carry out your assessment. Now, your assessment could be individually based, partially, it could be based as how you perform as a group, as a department. And of course, it will be objective and independent assessment. The uh, criteria will be known in advance. But you'll also have a right of appeal. So if you get assessed, you feel, like, well, I think the assessment is not fair, then you can appeal that. 
I know in the Solicitor General's office they've already started this. Over there, one of the ways that they do assess you is you get assessed not just by your superiors, but you also get assessed by the people who report to you too. They want to also know how do you perform as a manager or as a senior person. Because that's also part of your job, how you manage your own people. So these are some of the criteria that will be there. And of course, the results will confirm movement up in the steps in the salary band and pay increases with the budget cycle. You see, the old way of thinking was that you get this sort of suck, you get this pay, and then you wait for five or seven years, and everybody goes off and negotiates, and maybe you get a five percent pay raise. I mean, to be frank with you, in the late last year, when we started talking to the unions, uh, Rajesh Singh came up to us and said, "Give us, give everybody a fifteen percent pay raise," and we said no. Because we said, you actually are still thinking in the old way. Because the 15% pay rise, you may be shortchanging your people. He said, okay, let's negotiate. So maybe you would have been happy to settle for 10%. So everybody would have got 10% pay rise. But we would not have been able to distinguish between specialist nurses, you know, midwifery. All of that now is done through the reforms. And again also, by having it across the board 15%, we are not actually being able to distinguish between the high performers and low performers. Also, there are certain jobs now that have got a 70% pay rise, a 40% pay rise, because that's what the market pays in trying to, you know, align them more closer to the market. So across the board, pay rise does not recognize specialization, does not recognize how the market is paying for those positions. In a few years' time, maybe five years' time or less than that, whatever the case may be, we could do another rebasing across the board. But in the meantime, you have individual assessments once the, this rebasing has been done uh, accordingly. <laughs> now, I wanted to also show you that uh, before I hand over to Jane, as you know that uh, we also announced various tax cuts. So anybody now, uh, previously, as you know, before the budget was announced, if you earn less than $16,000, you do not pay any taxes. Now we've increased it. If you don't pay any, if you earn up to thirty thousand dollars, you don't pay any taxes. But a lot of people don't understand this: that even if you earn more than thirty thousand dollars, you have also got a tax cut. Because the way the tax system works, that even if you've increased the threshold, the next person who pays tax, starting off from the threshold, the tax rate has come down. So I want to demonstrate to you that apart from the pay rise that we're giving you. You also are getting more money in your pocket because of the tax cuts. And I'll highlight that to you, if I can use it as an example. So uh, maybe we'll go to the nurse team leader, Ben G. So over here. So before the reforms, uh, a nurse team leader, Ben G, was getting $24,000. was getting $24,000. Tax they paid would be $909, right? At the income tax threshold of $16,000. Total take home pay was $23,000. Now, after the job evaluation exercise, that person's salary has gone up from $24,000 to $28,000. If the income tax threshold remained at $16,000, they'll pay $1,600 as tax. So the take home pay is $26,000. So if you compare that to that, overall increase in your pocket is $3,100. But now because you've got a tax cut or income tax threshold has gone up, so you've got that $28,000 here, you no longer pay any tax, so your take home additional pay is $4,700. If you compare that to this, it's an increase of almost $1,600 because of the tax cut. Now let's take somebody who is earning more than $30,000. So, uh, for example, a person who may be, say, a principal medical officer. Maybe take, sorry, let's, let's take a senior surveyor. A senior surveyor, before the reforms, is getting paid $31,000. They paid taxes of $2,000, take home paid $29,000. Now, after the reform, their salary has gone up by, what, 40%, uh, Jane? 38%. So they've got a 38% pay rise, so the gross pay is now $43,000. Tax of $4,200. Take home pay is $39. they have got a salary increase of $9,800. But because they've also had the tax cut, so instead of paying $4,000, they paid $2,300 tax. 
So the overall money that they're taking home at this stone is eleven thousand dollars. So everybody actually has got a tax cut. Obviously, those people below thirty thousand dollars no longer pay any tax here, but everybody else. So just remember that it's not just the salary increases itself, but also the tax cut that's putting more dollars and cents in your in your pocket. Now I'll pass it over to Jane. Uh, Jane, sorry by the way, is a director of the Civil Service Reform Management Unit. Jane first came to Fiji uh, when we were setting up the elections office uh, before the 2014 elections. Um, we wanted to have a permanent elections office. Under international standards, um, you should have an elections office with permanent staff. The way that elections were conducted previously in Fiji was, there was nobody in the elections office, you just had a supervisor. Just before the elections, they would recruit people from outside and from other ministries. Then conduct the elections, and after elections, everybody would go back to where they came from. International standards require that you should have a permanent staff. So the elections office now, the Fijian elections office, is something like uh, in excess of 60 staff. So they build the capacity, etc. Of course, now elections in Fiji are also held sooner rather than later. Before elections were held every five years. Now elections cannot be held for any longer, any uh, period over than four years. So three and a half to four years, you must hold elections. So Jane was actually, um, uh, through aid, through the Australian uh, Foreign Affairs, was given uh, to us as one of the experts. She's got enormous level of experience in HR and worked in a lot of uh, countries overseas too. So she did the setup for the uh, elections office, Fiji elections office. But after that, then we used her for this particular reform and she's been doing a fantastic job and I'll take, get her to take this through the to the different bands, thanks. So the guideline for job evaluation came out in January this year. It's available on the Public Service Commission website. It's been there since the end of January this year. So it explains the policy behind job evaluation. It confirms the fundamental change that we are moving to position-based pay. So pay is all about the position and how the job is evaluated, not the person who sits in the job. So the person's performance is a separate issue to the evaluation of the position. So when we do job evaluation, it's the job that's evaluated and not the person who is sitting in the job. The bands are determined by the requirements of the job through that job evaluation process. And I'll explain the factors shortly. The qualification requirements are only one of 10 factors that are considered when we evaluate the job. Job evaluation is based on a couple of assumptions. One is that the person who will occupy the job is competent. So we don't evaluate jobs based on what might go wrong or what mistakes a person might make. We assume that the people who get those jobs are competent and able to perform their duties. The other thing we assume in job evaluation is that the workforce management or the establishment management is right. That means that we don't look at the volume of work. We assume that the organisation has organised the work so that it is fairly distributed and everyone has a fair workload. If those elements aren't right, and we know in some ministries they're not, they can't be fixed through job evaluation. They have to be fixed in other ways, as in the ministry needs to redistribute the work, the ministry needs to restructure, the ministry needs to train its staff and make sure that everyone is able to do the work. Not everything can be fixed through job evaluation. Okay? So the Minister mentioned a number of different guidelines and I just want to recap on the relationship between them before I go into the technical part of job evaluation. Because people get quite confused about all these different HR things that are not part of your normal work. Okay. So the, the job evaluation is about looking at the requirements for the job and therefore de determining what band it goes on to and what salary attaches to the job. It's all around the duties and the requirements of the job, nothing to do with the person. Open merit is about, it starts to be about the person. It's about how we advertise the position and the assessment that we run to determine who has the most merit to be able to do that job. So who gets appointed to the job. And then discipline, of course, is about making sure that if people aren't doing what's required in the job, we can correct that. 
And the last one is performance assessment. So where job evaluation was about the job, performance management or performance assessment is about the person who's in the job. It's the formal assessment that determines how you move from one step to another in the salary bands. So the position attaches to the band, but the step is related to the person who's in the job. Okay? So that's how those different guidelines come together in terms of managing the different areas of, the, of um, your terms and conditions. Job evaluation, there were some issues. There are different cadres and professions who are not happy with the outcome of the job evaluation. The results of the job evaluation are directly related to how good the documentation was that was submitted. Okay. Job evaluation is done by committees, accredited, trained people, internationally accredited from across the civil service. We trained 200 people, they worked in committees, but they are dependent on the job documentation that was submitted by all of you. So there was a job evaluation questionnaire and there was a job description and everyone was asked to fill it out and we got lots and lots of them from all over the country but the quality of the information varied. Some groups of positions didn't give, they undersold their jobs or they didn't give enough accurate information to someone who's not necessarily from their own profession to be able to evaluate the job. So while we had 200 trained evaluators and they do represent almost all of the occupations in the civil service, they're still reliant on the information that you provided through that documentation. All of the job evaluations are now complete. The last lot of them, which was tranche three, the technical positions, they, the results of that went to the permanent secretaries on Monday this week and um, the payroll is currently generating the report, so the contract should be out by next week for those jobs, anyone who's in those positions. When I talk about the contracts, the process for issuing the contracts is that payroll actually generates a list of everyone who's in the current jobs. And then payroll has a formula that they use to calculate the step on the band that you move to in transition. That all comes out in a spreadsheet. We check the spreadsheet, make sure that everything looks right, as in we look at it and make sure that everyone's got an increase, and then we send it to the ministries for them to issue the contracts. The contracts are for the position that you own, your substantive position. So if you're in an acting position, the contract is on your old position, not your acting position. But there should be another letter that continues your acting arrangements. And the Ministry should do both of those at the same time. I have to say, sometimes the payroll records are not good enough in some ministries for them to be able to generate the acting letters. So for people who are already acting, sometimes that acting letter can come a little bit later. The transitional step, particularly for nurses, that nurses here? Okay, so the reason for the transitional step is because step one is above 15% and the rule was that you went to the step on the band that was within 15%. Step one is above 15% of your current salary. So if we had put you onto step one, you'd be acting and we would have been putting you onto a lower band and you'd have to apply for your jobs. So that's what the transitional step is there for. So the transitional step is there so that we can um, do a performance assessment and then move you on to step one. Can we take questions at the end? Yes. Okay, for the nurses? Okay. So, yeah. So the transitional step is used because step one is above 15%. The increase was more than 15% from your current salary. So, if we had not introduced the transitional step, you would be in the same boat as some of the higher level positions where they're now acting on their jobs and where we have to advertise the jobs and you have to apply for the jobs. And we didn't want to do that across the, all of the registered nurses. So instead, we've got the transitional step 
as soon as we get performance assessment introduced, we can move you on to at least step one, and then the more formal performance assessment, or the, the full range of the performance assessment, will move you on to higher steps in the new budget year. Okay? So it was really to try and make sure that we didn't have to make you all apply for your jobs. That's it. <laughs> okay. So, in terms of information that's floating around, there have been no decreases in salary. Like I said, we check the payroll reports, we make sure that everyone has gone to a step where they've received an offer that's higher than their current salary. There are no decreases in salary. Anyone who thinks that they've been made an offer that's lower than their current salary needs to check with their HR because it won't be right. Now, in this volume of work, we're willing to admit that there could be some mistakes. Okay? So if you think that it's not right, check it and we will make sure that it gets corrected. If you're not happy with the band that your position has gone to, so if you look at the band that has been allocated, so not your particular step, but the band that has been allocated for your position, you think that it's not right, there is a review process. It's, it's in the guideline, it's already part of the policy. It says that you have to make an application to your permanent secretary and demonstrate that something's different from the documentation that was originally submitted because if we evaluate again on the same documentation, it will come out the same way. So you have to show that perhaps it was one of those examples where you undersold the job, where you didn't fully reflect the requirements of the job in the documentation. And you might, that's why we go through the factors so that you understand the sorts of criteria that we used when we evaluate the jobs. The start date for the pay is the first pay that begins in the month that you sign the contract. So it's not the first of the month, it's the first pay, so the first pay fortnight in the month. So in August, it was the 13th of August. For those signing their contracts in September, it's the 10th of September. If you're signing your contract in October, it's the 8th of October because it's the beginning of the pay fortnight that starts in the month. So I mentioned there's a 15% threshold. If the jobs, when they are evaluated, if the increase for the job is more than 15%, the policy decision is that it has to be advertised. You are offered a contract on a lower band, again on a step that gives you the maximum increase up to 15%. In ministries like health and education, there is then automatic acting on your current role so that there's no disruption to services until such time as the open merit process is complete. So the reason for issuing the, the contract on the lower band is to give you a safety net. So once the open merit process is complete, if you don't win the job, if you're not successful through the open merit process, you know that you've got, still got a job and you still had a pay increase, of up to 15%. And those, those bands were allocated based on the highest band and the highest step to still give you the maximum increase of up to 15%. The snapshot that you have would show you what that band is. So for example, the snapshot is the three page document that doesn't fit on a slide. Okay. But the left hand columns are uh, the actual increase that's attaching to the position. So if you were to look, for example, at nurse practitioner on band I, you would see that the increase is 76%. And then the right-hand columns show that the nurse practitioners are being allocated a contract at band G. Even though their job has gone to band I, they get a contract at band G with an increase that's up to 15%, and they get an acting letter at the higher band until the open merit is complete. So in that snapshot, you would very quickly see which jobs are affected. Not all jobs are listed. Okay? All of the jobs in the civil service come out in a book that's about that thick. So we made a selection of some to give an illustration and it would, your ministry has a full list of all of the jobs and the different levels and the bands that they go to. 
So every ministry has their own list. Ministries where there's a lot of jobs to be advertised and they are mainly at the top. So the bigger increases were at the top and I'll explain how that happened when we go through how the salary bands were constructed. So ministries where there's a large volume of jobs have to prepare a recruitment plan and publish it. So particularly in health and education, the HR departments are working on a recruitment plan that will say, these jobs will be advertised in this month, we'll shortlist here, the assessment will be here, we plan to make appointments. Okay. So that you can plan and you can see which jobs will be advertised together. You can decide, you might decide to apply for all of them. That's what Open Merit's about. It's up to you how much effort you want to put into writing job applications. So the job evaluation factors, how did we actually put jobs onto the bands? It is a technical process. It's not a science, it is a methodology, but it has a lot of scientific research behind it. We used a, um, a methodology called SP10. It's a commercial methodology owned by a company in New Zealand. It's used a lot in Fiji in partnership with PricewaterhouseCoopers. It's SP10 because there's 10 factors. Okay. So the first of those factors is education. So education is very important in job evaluation. It has the highest weight of any of the factors, so it's not an equal score for each factor. But it's the education that's required for the job because we're evaluating the job and not the person. So it's not the education that's held by the person who might be sitting in the job, it's the education that's required for the job. And because we're evaluating the job and not the person, if the person holds a higher qualification than that that is required for the job, it has no impact on the job evaluation because we're not looking at the person, we're looking at the job. If when we do performance assessment, if the person has a higher qualification, it's not an automatic increase in step. What we're looking at is how does the person use that qualification to show that they have a better performance in their job, they have better outcomes, they produce something better than someone who has a lower qualification. And that's how it's reflected in the performance. So there are no automatic increases based on qualification. It's all about how you use your qualification in the job. But of course it has an impact. Okay? As an example, if we look at nurses, that's why the specialised nurses, the midwives and the other group of nurses who've gone on to the higher band, a lot of it is because they require a higher qualification. They require a different qualification to a registered nurse. They need something on top. And that has a big impact on the score. The second one is experience. Now, it's not true that we don't consider experience. We do. But we consider it differently to how it might have been considered in the past. In job evaluation, experience is how long does it take to learn the job? How long does it take for you to gain all of the skills and the knowledge that you need in order to be able to be left alone to do that job without someone constantly teaching you or monitoring what you're doing. That's experience from job evaluation perspective. Some jobs, it might be six months. If you're a receptionist, it might be six months before you're fully competent and you can be left alone and your supervisors would be sure that you're sending a person in the right place. But other jobs, of course, it can take years to get the, the level of knowledge, the level of skill that you need to fully perform the range of that role. And that's experience in this sense. It's not about how long the particular person who's in the job has been in the job. And we know that that's how a lot of the questionnaires were filled out because I would get three jobs that were exactly the same and the experience would be different, probably based on whoever wrote the job but it's about how long does it take to learn the job. Complexity is about how predictable is the job. So when you come to work, do you know exactly what you're going to do every day? Some people do. Some people, they come in, they write checks or they process forms. That's what they do. They know exactly what they're going to do every day. For other people, the job is completely unpredictable. They don't know when they walk through the door. They have no idea what's going to come through that door. 
Okay? So the, the more predictable the job, the lower the score. The less predictable, the higher the score. Scope, how much control do you have over the resources that you need to do your job? Can you go out and get what you need or are you dependent on other people in order to perform your job? Problem solving, how many rules are there with your job? How, what type of um, problems, what type of problems do you solve and how easy are those problems to solve? So are the problems that you encounter able to be solved by referring to a procedure manual or are the problems that you have to solve harder? Do you have to research, do you have to rely on a lot more knowledge in order to solve those problems? Freedom to act is directly linked to problem solving. So when we're talking about problems, freedom to act is about who do I go to if I don't know what to do? Is there someone, do I have a direct supervisor who can guide me on how to solve the problems? Or do I have to figure it out for myself? Okay. Can I actually make decisions or does someone else tell me what to do all the time? That's freedom to act. The impact of decisions, again, we assume competence, but this is about assuming competence. What happens when you make a decision? Does it impact on the reputation of the ministry? Does it impact on the spending of the ministry? Can you lose the ministry money? Can you make the ministry money? So that's impact. Interpersonal skills is about who you talk to and for what reasons, why you're talking to them. So we break it down into internal and external. So the people that you talk to, are they internal to your organisation or do they come from the general public or other organisations? And then why are you talking to them? Are you talking to them to explain things to them? Are you talking to them to um, teach them something or to persuade them to do something different? Are you talking to them to negotiate with them? Okay, so different levels of communication with different types of people. Authorities is about whether you can spend money and whether you can hire and fire staff. Now most people in the public sector, this is confined to the permanent secretary. But a lot of people do have a budget even though they can't spend. Okay? So there are different scores depending on whether you're ultimately responsible or whether you're recommending to someone else that you spend money. And the last one is about how many people you supervise. And it's the total number of people. So not just the direct people that you supervise, but also the indirect people. So the people who report to the people that you supervise are also counted under the supervision, the people management. So those are the 10 factors. They're the elements that go into deciding a job. So next time you have to fill out a job evaluation questionnaire, think about those when you explain your job. Now, there was some training provided, but, and I know the Ministry of Health actually did workshops in all of the divisions about what to expect, what the factors were, and how to fill out the questionnaires. Other ministries, not so much. But there is ongoing training. We're still providing training for people. It's not about upselling your job, it's about getting your job right and making sure that it's fair. So if you think of those factors as one side of the coin, that's how jobs went on to the bands. But the bands themselves were constructed independently. So the money that's on the bands wasn't done by the same people who did the job evaluations. And the people doing the job evaluations didn't know how much money would be on the bands at the time they were evaluating the jobs. Okay. So the bands, there are 15 broad bands with A at the bottom and O at the top and they replace all of the old occupational scales and all of the GWE rates. So everybody now fits onto those salary bands. They are benchmarked to the private sector. So we've been talking about benchmarking for quite a long time now, since the end of 2015, I think we first started talking about benchmarking. But what does that mean? What it means is that the midpoint Step four, which is the one that's bolded in the salary bands. The salary bands are constructed around the midpoint and it's the midpoint that 
is the result of all the research with the private sector to look at what does the private sector pay for jobs. So when we started to look, there was a compensation benchmark survey by the World Bank, started at the end of, uh, end of 2015, early 2016. We selected a sample of jobs in the public sector, went to the private sector and said, do you have similar jobs? Tell us how much you pay for these jobs. So that was the first piece of research. The second piece of research, because that piece of research confirmed that there's not much of a private sector for teachers and nurses in Fiji. So the second study was specifically for teachers and nurses. And again, we asked the World Bank. And the World Bank researched around the region, not what teachers and nurses are paid, but what occupations are paid similarly to them in those countries so that when we came to the job evaluation, we could say, okay, well, around the region, teachers are paid similarly to these occupations, nurses are paid similarly to these occupations. How did we go with our job evaluation? Yes, they're in the same bands. Okay? So that was what we were looking for, for teachers and nurses. Um, then when we partnered with Strategic Pay, they have a partnership with PricewaterhouseCoopers who do the annual salary survey in Fiji. So we also have that data specific to Fiji. And because they use the same job evaluation methodology, we can actually look at it and say, for a points range of this range, this is the dollar value of what gets paid in the private sector. Now the first thing we found, and the minister referred to this as well, is that at the bottom of the band, we already paid more than the private sector. So our drivers and our cleaners and our messengers are paid more than what people pay in the private sector. So in constructing the salary bands, it's not a straight comparison at that midpoint to the private sector. The original decision was that we were going to benchmark to 75%. That was the recommendation from the World Bank, 75% of the private sector. At the bottom of the bands, we're on about 110% of the private sector. At the top, it's still about between 60 and 70% of the private sector. And in the middle, we're on 100% of the private sector. An average of 94% across all of the bands. Okay. So, at the top, even though we're still below the private sector, that's where the big increases are. So that's why it's a sliding scale. I mean, they're still getting big increases it's still a competitive salary with the private sector, but no, it's not matching the private sector. So that was the other side of the coin. So that's how jobs got onto the bands and how the bands themselves were constructed. Allocating you your step on the band was very much a mechanical process of, we know what band your position went to, we find the step on the band that provides the maximum increase of up to 15%. So if you think that you should have gone on to a higher step for whatever reason, the first thing you need to do is calculate whether it's more than 15%. If it is, then there's been a mistake and we can fix it. But it was a computer-generated formula for 90% of people, so it should be right. For new people coming into the system, it's important to understand that the bands are not constructed for people to necessarily start on step one. So the old salary scales, everyone started on step one and then they moved their way up. Maybe. The salary bands are not constructed that way. They actually overlap. So the, the increases between the bands are at step four, but some of the lower steps actually overlap with the steps on the lower, on the lower bands. Okay. So you might find if you were on a lower band and on a higher step, if you got a promotion, if you started on step one, you'd actually lose money because they're not constructed for that to happen. They're constructed so that new appointments, you go to the step between one and three depending on how well you perform in the recruitment process. So if you get above 80%, in the recruitment selection, you've got a step three. If you get 70 to 80%, you go step two. Below that, you go to step one. And that's because that those steps are what we call the development steps. So therefore, people who don't 
fully meet the requirements of the job yet, still need to learn something on the job once they start, and then once they have a performance assessment and it's shown that they're fully meeting the requirements of the job, they move to step four. So step four is also what we call the competence step. So it's the step that's benchmarked to the private sector and it's the competence step. So after a probation assessment, if you're performing 100% of the duties, you'd move to step four. If there's still some more training or development that's required, then you'd stay on steps one to three, depending on the extent of that training. After performance assessment comes in, steps five, six and seven are there for people who are doing more than the requirements of the job. So step four is for everyone who's doing the requirements of the job, so meeting the full requirements of the job, doing everything that's required. Steps five, six and seven are for the high flyers, for the people who are going that extra mile. So when I said before, positions where the increase is over 15% have to be advertised. Okay? Um, this is to make sure that some of those big increases that we're confident that we've got the right person in the job. Because there's not a lot of solid performance data from the last few years. We know that some ministries have been doing the upper, but we also know that it doesn't actually match with the results for the ministry. So we need stronger data. And that's why those jobs are being advertised. I've talked about the rest of it. So that's all from the job evaluation side. We wanted to let you know what else is happening in ministries as well, because we talked about the guidelines, and a lot of that is about the HR. But there are other things happening in ministries, and it's important that you know that these things are happening. So you can ask more questions of your own ministries. I'm not going to go through each individual ministry this afternoon. But in all ministries, there's a requirement for business process improvements. So we want to provide better service to the public. We can only do that by making our processes more efficient. So every, every ministry is required to look at at least some of its processes every year. That's actually part of the Permanent Secretary's performance assessment with the Commission. It's one of their indicators. So they're quite keen to make sure something happens with that. Every ministry has had an institutional review. So there's only a couple still to go. Education and industry and trade aren't done, but other ministries are all already done and the ministries have their reports. Some of them are seeking external support to implement the recommendations. So in the Ministry of Health, the PS has had a consultant come in to help with a headquarters restructure and they're looking at some other activities. Um, some ministries like agriculture have said that they can manage to implement the recommendations without external support. Okay, so it depends on the ministry as to what they're looking at in terms of the outcomes. So, Education are also reviewing their structures, so they haven't had their World Bank review yet, so they're doing this as instead the World Bank is supporting with these activities. So a review of their headquarters and class sizes. And in health, I mentioned headquarters of management structures. They've also specifically looked at um, some support to review the medical superintendent and the hospital manager roles in the hospitals. So the terms of reference for that are in draft form at the moment. And health is also the pilot for the HR management information system. So it's quite difficult to manage a ministry the size of health using spreadsheets. Right? So health is the pilot for the HR management information system and that should start in the next month or so. If you want more information, here's where I advertise our services. So the Reform Management Unit, we do have information officers and they're available to come out and do updates of these sessions in between because obviously Minister can't travel all the time to keep coming back and doing these sessions. So our information officers are available to come back and give updates or to give specific information about other areas of the reforms if you're interested. 
You can request an in-house session, they travel, we send them out all the time, wherever we know that there's a group of people who will actually come to attend the sessions. There's lots of training going on. So the Civil Service Reform Management Unit, we belong to the Ministry of Economy, but the Ministry of Civil Service, we work quite closely with the Ministry of Civil Service. The Ministry of Civil Service has a core skills training unit and they run CV writing and interview skills. So if you look at the snapshot, you'll see that there's lots of jobs going to be advertised soon. If you want to be a good competitor for those jobs, you should get yourself onto the CV writing and application skills training. Okay? If you have any difficulty locating the details, it's on the Ministry of Civil Service website. If you have any difficulties locating it, email us on the inquiries email and we'll send back the details for you. And then through the Reform Management Unit, we run the training for the discipline. So the discipline guideline has quite a lot of training associated with it. And it's also a great opportunity if you're going to be applying for any of those management or supervisor roles that will be advertised, because the training for discipline is very focused on good supervision and management. So it's an opportunity for you to improve those skills in preparation for when those jobs come out, and also for your own development. So that's my advertisement for us. Other specific inquiries, we have an inquiries email address. Okay. We're a bit um, snowed under at the moment, but that doesn't mean don't send your inquiries because we are working through them. It means just be patient with us because quite often we have to go back to the ministry for information in order to be able to resolve the issue. But we're getting faster. We've appointed someone who is going to manage the process or at least keep on top of it and try and get back to people and say, yes, we've got it, we're working on it. Um, so please do email us with your specific inquiries. Uh, thank you, Jane, for that. Um, I hope that uh, clarifies a number of the issues that you may have had, but I'm sure you also have a lot of questions. Uh, that you may want to ask uh, as a result of the presentation of the slides. As you said, the idea behind the reforms is to ensure that uh, we create a modern uh, day civil service, as we also highlighted that uh, some of the ministries have adopted the reforms on a much more uh, robust manner in, in compared to some of the others. Uh, you may also have some administrative issues you may want to raise. That's obviously separate to the reforms themselves, but we'll be quite happy to take uh, those queries from you what we normally do is that once we open the floor for any questions that you may have, we'll answer those questions. And then when we go into the presentation of the budget, which we'll do very quickly, whilst I'm doing the presentation of the budget, if you have individual complaints, you can go to the back of the room or to the side of the room, and uh, Jane and Bernadette will actually be able to take your individual queries uh, if you want to raise any specific issues pertaining to you, uh, maybe your contracts, etc., that you can raise with them. Uh, the email address that Bernadette has put up there, it's again, of course, you can send any queries you may have specific to you, you may have to raise it later on. Uh, please understand that that email address is not seen by everybody, it's essentially seen by two or three people, so there's a particular level of confidentiality if you want that maintained. So if you have any issues pertaining to yourself, any personal issues to do with work, uh, you can uh, send that uh, uh, to us uh, on that email address. Okay. So we'll open up the floor. Uh, if you have any questions, please feel free to ask anything.